Good morning. It's wonderful to see everyone here. Thank you so much for being here. As, as Brother Nathan said, if you are visiting with us, we want, we want you to know that you are honored guests. And we, we, we thank you so much for being here. We invite you back at any time that you're able to come. We hope that you find that you are comfortable here in the services and that you are edified and that you are benefited in your Christian life by being here with us this morning. That I hope the things that we study are edifying to you and will help you in your Christian walk. Once again, I would like to thank everyone for making the choice and the decision to be here this morning. That you chose to be here when you could be elsewhere. That you made the decision to be here. And it's a wonderful, important, correct, and right decision that you have made this morning. And that's what I would like us to talk about this morning is our decision-making process, our choices that we make. You know, life is about choices. I chose to wear my seafone green, sh green shirt this morning because everybody loves the seafone green shirt. I chose this outfit. You chose the outfit that you are wearing this, this morning. You probably chose what you ate for breakfast. And if you're children, you probably didn't choose what you ate for breakfast. You just ate what your parents chose for you. But life is about decisions. We make decisions every day on, on what we should do. One of those decisions is that we choose to become a Christian, that we choose God. We choose to serve him. And there are some people that choose not to serve him. Why? Why do they do that? Why do we make those decisions? Or maybe there's some decisions in our life that we make and we're not sure if that's the right decision or not. You know, me and Miranda decided to let the girls have a sleepover. So I had a house full of 13 year old girls. I wasn't sure if that was the right decision that we made. It turned out to be a nice decision. They had a good time. We had, had a great time. But I want us to talk about the decision that we make that is absolutely sure. A decision that we know is right. And that's choosing God and choosing his son as our savior. And that's what I, I want us to talk about this morning. What is your decision, the choices that we make? Why do we make the choices that, that we make? Have you made the right choice this morning? Do you continue to make that choice every single day to be a Christian, to be a follower of God, to make the right choices and make the right decisions? Now, if I ask everybody, don't do this, to raise their hand if you have ever made a bad choice, well, I'm sure everybody's hand is going to go up. We make bad choices. We make bad decisions. If you look at the children of God, you read the Old Testament, you see those people in the Bible. Guess what? They made some wrong choices, too. They made the wrong, <laughs> the wrong decision before. But they continue to choose God. They continue to repent of those things. They continue to make the decision to be a Christian, to follow God. And that's what I'm talking about. Not us making a wrong choice, wrong decision. I'm talking about us making the correct life choice, the correct life decision. Now, the Bible defines choice, this, or excuse me, the dictionary defines choice as to select from a number of possibilities to pick by preference, to prefer or to decide, as we're talking about this morning, to want or desire. You know, Riley read from Deuteronomy chapter 30, and I appreciate that. And as you see what God is saying there, and we're going to get to those verses here later, God is saying you've got some possibilities there. One is life, one is death. One is a blessing, and one is a curse. And God is saying, guess what? You get to choose. God's saying, you've got one thing on the other hand, and you've got the other thing on the other hand. Do you think of your choices and your decisions like that? Life or death? You have the choice to choose life or to choose death. And here's the big thing. Sometimes the choices and the decisions that you make will affect somebody else. If you choose the correct thing, it's going to help somebody else. You choose the wrong thing, it could lead somebody else down the wrong path, the wide and broad path. And that's what I would like us to talk about this morning. But that one thing there in the end of that definition there, desire, keep that in your mind. We're going to come back to that, and we're going to talk about that some more this morning. And the Bible tells us in Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 and 15, here the Bible says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in, in, in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood, and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. Verse 15, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Have you heard that, 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 those verses before? Have you heard that scripture before? I'm sure you have. That here they have gone, uh, gone, have gone aside and Joshua is saying here, you've got a choice now. We, we, we've gone across. We've done what God wants us to do. And now's the time to make a decision. He said, you can choose to serve God or you can choose not to serve God. That's the choice. That's the decision. 
And it says there, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, well, choose you this day who you will serve. And I, I want us to understand that that verse is more powerful than just a cool sign that we buy at Hobby Lobby and put in our house. It means a lot more than that. That it's not just saying, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Well, guess what? We need to make that choice and that decision every time we get out of bed. It's not just a one-time deal. We wake up in the morning, we say, this day, I will serve the Lord. We wake up again, this day, I will serve the Lord. We wake up again and again and continue to make that decision. But that's what's wonderful about the Bible there is from the, from, from the beginning in the Old Testament, God has given the people the choice. God does not force someone to follow him. Jesus does not force someone to choose him. But that choice is there for everybody. For everyone has that opportunity. Everyone has that choice. And that's what Joshua is saying here. Today, choose who you're going to serve. Choose the Lord or don't choose the Lord. Going back to our verses here that, that Riley read in, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, I'd like to revisit those verses. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 11, the Bible says, For this commandment which I command thee this day, it, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it? What do you th what, can you see what God is saying here? He's saying, guess what? This commandment that I have given you, this old law, you need to do it. I've given you uh, uh, the commandments. I've given you the old law. And if you go back and study the old law, there's a lot of things in there. But it's not real complicated to understand. That law is saying, do these things, don't do these things. And what the Bible here is saying, here, it's not far off anymore. It's not in heaven Who's going to go to heaven and bring this word to us? It's not beyond the sea. Who's going to go beyond the sea and bring it to us? He's saying the word is near. As a matter of fact, in, in, in the next verse, the Bible says, but the word is very nigh unto thee. It means it is very near. It is in thy mouth. It is in thy heart. And that, that thou mayest do it. So he's kind of not leaving any excuse there for the, for the children of Israel. He said, you know the word. You know the commandment. It is very near. And that's the same for us as well. Right there is the word. It's very near. It's laying right there. We've got it. We can read it. We can study it. So here's saying that commandment, that law that I've given you, that life and that death choice, it's not far off. It's near. As a matter of fact, it's in your mouth. As a matter of fact, it's in your heart. You know what you're supposed to do. You have to choose to do it. Verse 15 says, see, I have set before thee this day life and good death and evil in that I, I command thee this day to love the lord thy god and to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments that thou mayest live and multiply and the lord thy god shall bless thee in the land whether thou goest to, to possess it verse 17 but if thy heart turn away so that thou wilt not hear but shalt be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them i denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the, lot, uh, upon the land, wh whether thou passes over, over Jordan to go to possess it. So he's saying there, that's the choice. If you do it, it's going to be good. If you don't do it, it's going to be bad. That's the life. That's the death. That's the blessing. That's the curse. And it says there in verse 19, And I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed or thy descendants may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God and that thou mayest obey his voice and that thou mayest cleave unto him for he is thy life and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob to give them. It says, I have set before you life and death. Therefore, choose life that both Thou and thy seed may live. So you see, the choice and the decision affects not only you, it can affect your family. It can affect those around you. God is saying, I have set before you blessing and a curse, life and death. And guess what? You get to make the choice. But what does God want you to do? <clears throat> God there says, choose life. I've given it to you. I've given you the, the, the choice. I'm encouraging you to choose life. That it is a decision that we, that we make. And it's nothing that we don't know. It's nothing that we can't go teach somebody or preach to somebody. We've got it. It's near. It's in our hearts. It's in our mouths. But we have to choose. God wants you to choose life. God wants you to do those things. He said that, that, that the Lord, that you may obey his voice and that you may cleave unto him. See, it's one thing to say 
that we believe in God. It's one thing to say that we believe in His Son. It's a different thing to obey His voice and cleave unto Him, grab Him, and be a part of Him. That's the, de that's the decision that we need to make. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 and 26, there's a character there who makes that decision. There's someone there who makes that choice. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 through 26, the Bible says, By faith Moses, when he was come two years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ at greater riches than the, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. So here's Moses. Moses is the one that, that wrote that law. He's the one that wrote, uh, wrote <coughs> Deuteronomy. He's the one that knows God's will. But, but there in the beginning there, it says that Moses refused to be called the Pharaoh's daughter, and he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. Do you like to choose to suffer affliction? Do you say, hey, there's some pain, there's some suffering, I'm going to go choose that. Sometimes that's not the first thing that we think on. That's not our first choice. Our first decision is to say, there's some affliction, there's some suffering, let's run towards it. But Moses did. Why? Why did he make that decision? Because it says there, he chose that instead of to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. What are the pleasures of sin for a season? That's the earthly things. That's not choosing God. That's choosing God. The, the, the pleasures of sin, that's earthly there for a, a season. But the reason that Moses chose what he did was in that next verse there where it says, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. So he's saying that even though he had the opportunity to, to stay in those pleasures of sin, he chose to be with God's people and suffer affliction. Why? Because he saw that there were greater riches, that there was a greater reward for doing those things. There was a great reward to be with the people of God because the treasures in Egypt, those were the pleasures of sin. He said, so he turned his back on Egypt and he was looking for that reward. Where the Bible there says that, that he had respect unto the recompense of reward, all that means is that he was looking for, he was looking towards that reward. He was looking towards that goal. Are we looking towards that reward? Are we looking towards that goal? You know, Moses made the correct, de the correct decision. Sometimes we don't make the correct decision. Or we see people out there that they know the word is near. They understand the word, but they don't choose. Why? Why do they not choose like Moses did? Why do they not make that choice to be with the people of God? Why do they make the choice to be with the treasures in Egypt, with the pleasures of sin? Why? Why do they make that choice? Why do they make that decision? Well, is it easy to sin? It's easy to sin. It's very easy to fall into those things, to fall into those traps. Sometimes we have to focus and really have our willpower to follow God because sin is all around us. As we see it every day, those pleasures of sin are everywhere. But Moses chose to suffer affliction with the people of God because he understood the reward. And that's what I think people don't get. They don't understand that we are following God so that we get that reward in, this, in the after this life. It's not about right now. We are strangers and pilgrims on this land. This world is not my home as we sometimes sing because we know where we should be. We want to be with God. We want to be the people of God. But some people don't make that decision. They don't make the right choice. Kind of like these people here in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 57, the Bible says, And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, he's talking to Jesus here, this certain man is talking to Jesus, and he says, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. He said, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and the birds have the air, of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Why did Jesus say that? You know, Jesus probably knew this person, or, or, or Jesus understood these things. That this person said, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, okay, understand this. I don't even have a bed to sleep in. That's our Lord and Savior. He said, foxes even have holes. I don't even have a hole to sleep in. He's making sure that the person that says, I'll follow you wherever you go, understands that you're going to follow me wherever I go. And there may not be a bed. And there may not be a meal. But following Jesus is a correct choice. Then the Bible says there in, in verse 59, and he said unto another, follow me. 
Jesus said, no, 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 follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Verse 6 said, Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. What's going on here? Jesus is, is telling this person to follow me. Now's the time. Come follow me. And he says, well, I've got something that I, I need to do first. It wasn't that Jesus didn't care about him, him burying his father. This person was wanting to go back to his old life and do something. And Jesus is saying, no. If you're going to follow me, follow me. Do you understand that now is the time for you to follow me? Now is the time to, for you to go and preach the word of God. And last, verse 61 says, And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee. But let me first go bid them farewell, which are at my house, which are at my home, at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. No man who has put his hand to the plow and starts plowing that field for God and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. What does that mean? Looking back at the old life, looking back at Egypt, looking back at those sinful pleasures there. God says, you cannot do that. If you're going to follow me, you put your hand in the plow and you keep on plowing. And that's what Moses did. Moses didn't look back. He didn't look back towards Egypt. Moses kept going forward. That he, Moses put his hand to the plow and kept going forward because he knew where the true riches and the true reward was, and that was in God. But th this verse here is profound to me. That any man who puts his hand to the plow and looking back is not fit for the kingdom of God. And sometimes that's hard. Sometimes we want to look back, but we can't. We must continue on as God wants us to do. But that's why I think people don't make that decision because they want to stay in that life. They want to stay in their old life. They're not ready to crucify the old man. They're not ready to be renewed. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, the Bible says, Enter ye in the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Does this verse scare you? Does it frighten you? It scares me. This says that many are going to go down the path of destruction, not a few, many. Why? Why is this road, why is this path so full of people? When Jesus was talking to those men saying that, follow me, or those saying, I'll follow you wherever you go, and he's saying, you need to understand that it might be difficult, it might be hard, but the reward is worth it profoundly, more than anything else on earth. That could be a hard, hard decision. But to not follow God, to just do whatever you want and stay in sin, that could be an easy decision. And sometimes we need to make the hard decision. You know why that road is so full of people? Because it's the easy road. It's easy. Just go do whatever you want, live your life, and go down that broad way. Think about driving. If, if I can go down a a six-lane highway instead of a two-lane highway, well, I might go down the, the sixth lane. It's easier. It's wider. But it says there, but, but narrow is the way, or straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Why? Because that's a little bit harder. That's a little bit more focused. That's a little bit more difficult to go down that narrow, straight path than a big, wide path. So it's about our choices. But why do we make those choices? How can we fix ourselves to make the correct choice? How can we want or desire to go down that narrow path? That's why, I, I, that's why I, I believe some people are not like Moses and they don't make that choice because they want to make that easy choice. They want to make that easy decision. The, the dictionary defines the word desire. To wish or long for, crave or want, to express a wish to obtain, ask for or request. You know why Moses chose to suffer affliction with the people? Because he desired that reward. He desired God. Do you desire God this morning? Is that your desire? Or is there something else that's in your way? Because one of the things that affects our choices and our decisions more than anything else is what we desire. See, Miranda wanted to start a diet. Awesome. So I was like, I'll do it with you. You know what I desire? Lots of food. Beef, enchiladas, steaks, can't have any of that kind of stuff. Bread, a French loaf that I could eat like a candy bar. That's what I want. I desire those things. Can't have those things. So I have to change my desire. So what do I do? I need to find something to get rid of that desire and fix it. Miranda, this is important to Miranda. 
and Miranda is important to me. So I desire to do this with her so that we can support each other, okay? That's the desire. That's for me wanting to help her and do these things together. And I can put that other desire away. When, this talk, when, it, when it talks about things that get in our way to follow God or making the wrong choice or, or the wrong decision, it's because our desires are not correct. And one of the biggest issues is talked about here in James chapter 3. And I'm going to read these verses from the New King James Version Bible if you're following along there. James chapter 3, verses 13 through 15, the Bible says, Who is wise and, and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. You know, one of the biggest things that gets in the way of us following God is ourselves. It says right there, but if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, that is not from above. That self-seeking, that is not from above. It is sensual, it is earthly, it is demonic. And that's strong language, brothers and sisters. And there's a, there's a thing going on right now about self-love. Love yourself. Learn to fall in love with yourself. And guess what? That is toxic and it is not biblical. That that is not what God teaches in his word, to love yourself. God teaches you to love him, to love his son, and to love your neighbor. Amen. And that's what's being said right here, that if you are self-seeking, that's not from above. As a matter of fact, that self-love not only is it not heavenly, it is demonic. It is earthly. It is sensual. That's not how we are supposed to live our lives. And that gets in the way of our decision-making process. When we wake up in the morning, we shouldn't choose to love ourselves. We should choose to love God and choose to love his son and choose to love his word. Continuing on there, it says, for <clears throat> in James chapter 3, verse 16, For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above, it is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So once again there, in James, the Bible says, For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. That self-love, that self-seeking, that's where every evil thing is. That's what the Bible says. If where that envy and that self-seeking exist, every evil thing are there. But the wonderful thing about the Bible, the wonderful thing about God's Word is that it will show you a problem in your life, and then it shows you how to fix that problem in your life. Because we all have problems. We all make the wrong choice and the wrong decision. But the Word of God helps us fix that. Because those next verses right there in those set of verses says, But the wisdom that is from above, that's the wisdom that we want. The wisdom that is from above is first pure and peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits. And it says there, now the fruits of righteousness. So how do we fix this issue if we have this self-love, this, this, this envying, or maybe there's some other sinful thing in our way? How do we fix that? It's from the wisdom that's from above. And that's this book right here. It's the Bible. We have the things that we can study and we can learn to have those be our, our desires and push away that fleshly, earthly desire. And it says there that the wisdom from above is full of mercy and good fruits. And I want to talk about fruit because if we focus on bearing that fruit of righteousness, or if we focus on bearing that fruit of the Spirit, we will be able to push away that self-seeking desire and we will be able to see clearly to make that decision of choosing Christ. And I want us to go and study that in Galatians chapter 5, reading from the New King James Version again. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 25, the Bible says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with the passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So we see that the Bible points out an issue. It points out a problem. If you're not making the right choice in the decision, there's something in your way. Maybe it's that self-love. Maybe it's that self-seeking or, or, or there's something else. The Bible says that if you focus on bearing the fruit of the Spirit, you can crucify those things. And the Bible says, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with the passions and desires. If that's a problem, if you are Christ, 
then you can crucify those desires. You can crucify the passions of the flesh, those sinful pleasures for a season. And you can look towards that reward, that recompense of reward. That if we are Christ, not only can we fix those problems, we can crucify them. And the Bible says that it's not saying that you can take those self-seeking desires, that you can take those things and just kind of hide them and, and mute them a little bit so you can be a little bit more godly. It says that you crucify them. You put them to death. They don't creep up anymore. They're gone. And the only way to do that is through God's word. The only way to do that is to be Christ. Make that decision. Make that choice. You know, when I was younger, I used to think that my desires were something that I couldn't control. It was like, I, I just have this desire. I, I'm sorry. I, I, I couldn't control myself. Well, yes, you can. I cannot control my desires. Yes, you can. I have these desires, these, these things, these wants. I have to have them. I, I have no control over it. You have every control over it. The Bible here says in Psalms chapter 10, verse 3, the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire and blesses the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 23 says, the desire of the righteous is only good, but the expectation of the wicked is wrath. You know, why is the wicked's desires wrong? Because they're wicked. Why is the desire of the righteous only good? Because they're righteous. Can you change that? If you are a wicked person, can you become a righteous person? Absolutely. If you're a righteous person, can you go back and be a wicked person again? Absolutely. It's all about the choice and the decision that you make. But can you change your desires? Yes. See, the desires of the righteous are only good because they are focused on bearing that fruit. They are focused on God. They are focused on his son. And the wicked desires of his heart are always wrong, are always bad. So I want us to think about that. If you're out, out there this morning or you know someone that says, I just can't help myself. I have these desires. I have these things that I can't control. You can absolutely control them. And God is there to help you control them. Jesus is there to help you control them. We are here to help anybody or, to, or, or that, that we need help. That many times we think that we cannot control these desires and the desires are in our way. We can. We can push those things away and crucify them if we are Christ. <clears throat> Now, the Bible says very plainly in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, it says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. You know what that is? It's a choice. It's a decision. You make that choice. You make that de decision. And there's some people that don't because I believe that their desires are in their way. I believe that they cannot push through those desires and see that great reward that is in Christ. You know the ones that make this decision? Are, are the ones that are talked about here in Psalms chapter 27, verse 4, where the Bible says, One thing have I desired of the Lord, one thing that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. Do you desire that this morning? If you desire the Lord and you haven't made that first decision there to believe in him and be baptized and be saved, that is one of the greatest decisions you can ever make. It's one of the best choices you can ever make in your life is to make that choice and that decision if you desire to do so. But you must make that choice. Now, it was told me a while back that you can lead a water or you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make the horse drink. I hope that we have done that this morning, that you can make that decision to drink, that you can make that decision to become a part of God's family. If you have made that decision, maybe it was years ago, you have become a Christian but you have not been waking up every morning and saying, this day I will serve the Lord. You know, Jesus says in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus says, and he said unto them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me daily. It's a daily choice. It's a daily decision that we make. It's not a one-time deal, once saved, always saved. We wake up every morning and make the choice and the decision to be a Christian. We wake up every morning and make the choice to follow God, just like Moses did. And it says they let him deny himself, not love himself. Let him deny himself and love me and take up his cross daily for me. That we are Jesus's children, that we are God's children, that we are those heirs with Jesus. What is your decision this morning? 
If you have never made that decision to be a child of God, <clears throat> it is one of the most important decisions that you will ever make. And God wants you to make that choice. Just like God told the children in Deuteronomy chapter 30, he says, I've set before you life and death. And he said, choose life. God wants you to choose life. Choose to become his. Choose to become a child of God. If you have made that decision years ago, but you have not been taken to heart that every morning you need to wake up and say, this day is another day that I get to serve the Lord. And you wake up the next morning, this day I get to serve the Lord. If you have fallen off that track and you need to get back on track, that, 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 that you need to put away those desires and see your desire for that reward in heaven. We are, prepared to, uh, we are prepared to assist you with that. We have water here for, uh, for baptism if you wish that. If not, we ask that you would come sit on the front row and stand and make your wishes known as we stand and sing.